John Thatcher. I'm delighted to be your host tonight. Uh, we're doing a very special edition of the podcast, Canadians Meet Mullinger, wherein we meet Mullingers making waves around the world. Uh, in particular tonight, we're going to talk to James Mullinger. And if you're like me, uh, maybe over the last 10 years or so, you've gone from hearing, who's that English comedian in New Brunswick, to somebody who's become the face of the Maritimes. My wife has even called him the Rick Mercer of Canada. He is a stand-up comedian, that's the root of everything he does, his core passion. But of course we're here tonight to talk about his new book, Brit Happens, and his podcast, which we are actually in the middle of right now. Uh, I've got a pile of questions, uh, James and I are really excited to, to talk tonight and get to know each other a little better. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome James Mullinger. Thank you for that lovely welcome, everyone, and John. Thank you, James. Thank you. I'm, like most people, I'm a big fan of John's uh, work, so this is genuinely an, an honor for me to be here with you. I've actually brought uh, two of your amazing books oh, for nice. you to sign for me tonight. <laughs> so this, is, uh, this is lovely. Thank you for awesome. everyone agreeing to spend your Saturday night with us. Cheers. Now, I have a little factoid for you. I thought you might appreciate this, James. We are at the Halifax Central Library. Did you know... This is where the infirmary used to be. This is where the infirmary used to be. So, last night I asked my father. Beautifully done, my friend. Uh, uh, it's funny, because I, um, I already knew my way here, but had I asked someone for directions, no doubt that is exactly what they would have said. So. Had you asked my father, I asked my father last night, I wanted to make sure, and this is what he told me. There was an empty parking lot, and a parking lot as well as the old Halifax infirmary where I worked for years, he was a chaplain. The giant Jesus was on the old infirmary. It was run by the Roman Catholic nuns from the Mount St. Vincent uh, convent until the province took over. If you want to visit the old giant Jesus, Christus Rexus, Christ the King, you need to go to Coal Harbor and see it installed in the garden near the Roman Catholic Church. So, Beautiful. It's amazing. <laughs> and I will do that because, as, as all of you know, in order to find your way around as a new Canadian to this region, you do have to have a degree in failed Canadian businesses. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and I, I now have one. Um, and, and I do now think, when people do it to me, I think sometimes that they're joking. Like, I was in Moncton a few weeks ago, and I was asking someone where the uh, Atlantic Lottery building was. And, and she said, oh, it's where uh, Woolco used to be. And, and I was like, oh, good one. And she was like, what? No, it is. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, not everyone knows the joke yet. I have work to do. So the first thing I wanted to ask you about, James, was... Being funny, so it's one thing when you're funny live, and you write your material, of course, but you have the immediate reaction. You can tell if it's funny or not. People laugh or they don't laugh. But when you're writing this book, the book is uh, sweet at times, sensitive at times, uh, serious at times, but funny, you know, page after page of funny. So can you tell us a bit about being funny on page and also what it's like when you don't get to have the reaction, you don't get to hear it. People will go home tonight and be chortling all over Nova Scotia, but you won't know. So what was it like to be funny on, on the page? It's a good question. Yeah, I am... Um... I think I, I mean, I definitely found the, the, the writing process or, or the release process quite nerve wracking because when I was writing it, um, I've always written a diary. As, as a child, I wrote a diary and it was something that got me through hard times. I, again, I wasn't, um, I didn't have a great childhood in terms of like, I didn't have many friends and I wasn't academic and I wasn't athletic. I was, I was what my mum recently jokingly described as a triple bill of failure for them. <laughs> uh, because uh, Normally, if, if your child doesn't play sport, maybe they're good at math. I had none of it, and, and I was too scared to talk to other kids, so I've always written a diary. And so I think the combination of, A, writing, which is something I've always done as a cathartic uh, outlet, um, combined with, obviously, writing it predominantly during COVID, meant that I kind of almost forgot uh, that people were going to read this. Um, and so the funny bits, I guess I found uh, somewhat easy to write, although as you rightly point out, it's such a different discipline, writing stand-up uh, to, to writing a funny, a funny book. Um, but so the thing that really terrified me most was the fact that uh, I suddenly when I saw it designed in PDF form, looking like a real book with page numbers, I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, it, am I actually going to alienate people who maybe like my comedy because they're going to go, oh my goodness, he's, he's so depressing. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was... Um, slight concern, but you're right, I mean, because the way I write stand-up is that I would come up with bullet points of ideas, like when, when I come up with a new, uh, when I'm writing a new show, I will make a list of 
bullet points. Sometimes they're written out, but a lot of the time it might just be one line, and it, it looks like the weirdest thing, because like, my kids sometimes find my, my set lists, and they're like, what's this weird shopping list? Glory holes? Balls? <laughs> like, uh, homemade wine? Like, what is this? What's this bizarre shopping list you've got here? And, um, and so the way I write stand-up is that I will uh, go on stage with these ideas and start t- talking, and then as the bits get more and more formed, I will tape record uh, these work in progress shows. And what I do is I, I tape record what I say on the night, and then I transcribe it word for word, and then I go through and highlight in red where the laughs came. And then I will, I mean, it's so scientific, and it's really boring as well. Like stand-up is supposed to be fun, and it, it, it's like, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a scientific process. Um, and, but what I will then do is highlight in red, and then basically work out which words can you lose in between the, the, the red marks to get to the joke. And of course, some of those words are, are vital, and they make the joke more uh, fulfilling because of it. So, it's, it's a, it's, so to your point, suddenly writing a, a book that is supposed to be comical, and a lot of the credit I have to put down to the, my editor, James Langer, who was um, meticulous at kind of uh, making me less long-winded. As shown, I'm, this is a very long-winded answer. <laughs> to, uh, so tightness is not a good, uh, is not one of my skills when it comes to... So I think a lot of the writing was probably quite long-winded, so it's a strange thing that, yeah, in my stand-up, I think I'm very get to the punchline quickly, but in real life, end up talking a lot of bollocks. <laughs> And how did you find, like, not getting the reward? Like, you don't know when people find things funny. I imagine you tested it with readers, but what's that part like? Just kind of letting your book go out there and do its, its own work. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it is really nerve-wracking. And when it went out there, I think because I put so much of myself on the page, and I mean, again, at that last minute, you know, when I suddenly realized that people were going to read this thing, um, I, there was a temptation to remove certain things. Um, and of course, but then I thought, well, if I'm doing this, I may as well be, be, be honest. This has to be honest. It has to be real. Um, I have to be um, essentially true to the reader. If I'm going to write a memoir, then it has to be exactly what happened and how I felt about these things. Um, um, so it was, it, was, it was, yeah, genuinely terrifying. But yeah, I, di- I didn't cut anything for that reason. And, um, and so the, res- the feedback has been lovely and in many ways, uh, even more fulfilling, I think, than stand-up, because I love, obviously, stand-up, and I love the art of coming on stage and making an audience laugh. But I have been, I mean, I'm doing it for a long time, and not that I've become jaded with it, but I don't come off stage, and it's not like high-fives all around. Like, you, come off, you can walk off stage from, with, with a standing ovation, and 10 minutes later be in your hotel room feeling lonely and, like, just normal. Whereas, I think because this is so much of, uh, I, I guess, to get philosophical, like, it's really me, um, and all of my insecurities, all of my worries, all of the struggles I've had in life. So when someone writes and says that they've enjoyed it or been moved by it, in some ways it actually means a lot more than uh, a standing ovation or, or an applause break in, in stand-up. And I want to talk a bit about the podcast, which we're on right now. Um, you started in August 2020, one of those 2020 projects, and it's, it's become, to me, it sounds like it should be on the CBC uh, it's, it's just a terrific interview. And some of the recent ones I've heard, you had Rick Mercer on uh, not long ago. And to hear him talk about his husband and their business and creative partnership, I'd never he- heard him talk that sort of openly. And for example, things like he was saying how he always put his name above whatever show he was on. And I think you or Rick compared it to being like a plumber. You know, if you're a plumber, she's going to put her name on the side of the van to tell you she's a good plumber. It's not bragging. And so to hear Rick talk like that was, was fascinating. You had Nancy Regan on recently as well. And I was telling my wife about how great the Nancy Regan interview was. And at one point she said, when did James move here? I said, I think 2014. She's like, how does he know Nancy Regan like we do? Because I don't think Live at Five made it to South London in the 1990s. And then I'll just mention uh, 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 Clifton Cremo, who you had on a little while ago too, a a Mi'kmaq comedian up in uh, Eskasoni First Nation up in Cape Breton. And to hear him talk about the challenges of doing stand-up comedy when it's the same 10 people every night, if you manage to get anybody to turn out, yeah. uh, and to, to do it as a Mi'kmaq person, like to sort of find the humor and to play with an audience that might not always expect that. So can you talk about what it's been like for you to go on the other side of the, the microphone and 
meet all of these people, and how do you make them seem like they've known you for 20 years? Well, that's a huge compliment, especially coming And do you tell them that you're recording them? That's what I most thought yes, with Rick Mercer. I was like, <laughs> did you tell him he's... <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's, it, the, the show was conceived by an all credit to, to Podstarter, who produced uh, the show, and Sarah, who is here tonight, who is an amazing stand-up comedian. If you have a chance to go and see Sarah perform stand-up, you should do so. Uh, she um, is, is, is the brains behind this, and, and, it's, and, and they, they all uh, conceived it. Um, as a as a as a new Canadian and someone who is fascinated with this country and loves this country, it has been an absolute dream project, and especially during COVID, to kind of meet and speak to all of these remarkable um, people. And yes, I mean, I guess one of the running things that does come up a lot, especially with performers, is you know, famously Canada doesn't have a star system. Famously, uh, performers have have complained, especially comedians have complained for many years here about needing to go to America to feel um, uh, recognised um, back home. Um, traditionally, of course, Canadian comedians do move to England or America to make it, and I, I'm one of the few that kind of made a decision to, to leave England. And of course, I didn't move here as a career move. It, it was it was a, it was a, a quality of life decision, but but in, weirdly, in some ways, became a career move uh, against you know, surprising odds. But. Um, yeah, what I found really interesting talking to Rick was that he had never really talked that openly about... Because I guess a lot of the time performers don't want to talk about not, not the ruthless side, but the business side of it, because it sounds... Um, it, no one wants to give away the intricacies of what it takes to get there. And so to, to Rick's point, yes, you know, he had to fight. Because classically in, Cana in uh, Canadian theatre, they don't want uh, artists' names above the name of the show. And the reason being, they want the show to be bigger than the artist. So that if the artist leaves... Um, they can fill them in and no one notices. And so it was, it was Rick's uh, manager and husband, Gerald, who fought for Rick's name to be above. Uh, well, actually, what he did was put Rick's name in the title, so it had to be, um, which, which is um, genius, but hence, Mullinger meets Canadians. <laughs> and, and, um, and so it was an interesting thing hearing about the ways, and I think that that's what I wanted the, the book to be very much about, was the reality of the grind, of what it takes to uh, turn what is a, a, a dream job and a ridiculously, you know, however many people say that they want to be a comedian, they want to feed a family telling jokes for a living. It's, it's, it's such an a, a absurd pipe dream. Just wanting to kind of convey what the grind is like to get there and, and indeed to, to, to continue doing it. But yeah, I, I really loved Rick opening up about those things because again he doesn't need to he could have very easily kept all of that stuff secret forever um and, and little things like when he played he was playing the national arts center in ottawa and it was he was playing like the little the hundred seater in the basement but back home gerald told all the newfoundland newspapers that he was playing the four thousand seater <laughs> so he like took out an ad and it was like a full page ad saying you know congratulations to Rick Mercer for selling out the National Arts Centre and then he came and had these huge homecoming shows and, and again I mean it's all smoke and mirrors but I think the, the, the weird thing is is that in bigger cities uh, traditionally or always in, in Hollywood and in London people have managers to do that for them uh, uh, and advisors and publicists and agents whereas here you are literally doing it all yourself um, and so you know I mean any when I moved here, I, and the way in which I got work was literally walking around handing out flyers myself. Like when, if my wife said, go to the, take the kids to the park, I'd be like, yeah, and I'd stuff my pockets with flyers. And I would be at the park and I would talk just a little bit loudly so people would go, oh, what's that accent? English, comedian, I'm doing a show next week. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and literally, I mean, it was, my whole life was, and because I've done fringes, like you do a fringe festival, that's your, your week. Your week is flyering and everyone you meet, you're chatting them up and you know, going into a bar, going, yeah, I'm doing a show. That, that's, that's, and performers do that for a week as a fringe. That's my entire life. Um, so uh, it's, um, it's, what I like about it is it's so grassroots and so, in many ways, even though it, it's, um, it, there's a strategy there, it's grassroots and it's real because in, in big cities there can be, or in, in, in places like Hollywood with a built-in star system and in London, there's backhanders, there's deals that can be done. In the matter of times, it's, all, it's word of mouth. And, and kind of like, to use the plumber analogy, if, if, if a plumber moves to a place and does good work, people will tell people and they will continue to get work. Um, uh, and same with a performer or an opera singer or a musician or a writer, people will, will tell people there's no kind of way, of, there's no marketing way of doing it. It's, it's word of mouth. Um, whereas, I guess to my point, like you can be a terrible plumber in England and get away with it for years. 
because <laughs> even if everyone you, whose home you flooded told everyone they knew, still 0.0001% of the population would hear about it. You flood one house in Nova Scotia. <laughs> you are never working again. And, and, and similarly with stand-up, it made, it made me realise I cannot bomb at a singer. Not that I ever didn't take gigs seriously in England, but I would go to a place and know that if I bombed, no one would ever hear about it. And I was, became very aware very quickly here that if I had a bad gig, everyone would know about it. So I had to work hard to make sure that hopefully didn't happen. And in the book, you describe some of those bomb nights and some surprisingly recently. Yes. <laughs> it sounds terrifying. Like as me, like with books, if I come up and I read about Peace by Chocolate and you all are blank faced, it's fine. <laughs> that's, that's the reaction I expect. <laughs> but to go up on stage, and, I mean, how do you get out of bed in the morning? How do you keep going there? How does it not destroy you? It would, <laughs> it's it would a good bring... question. I mean, I, as much as I, I never want to give um, bullies credit for anything, I think being bullied at school possibly helps in that um, nothing could ever be as bad as that. And I feel like um, when a gig goes badly, and again, I mean, you're right, there's, I, I document a lot of the, the awful gigs I had starting out, but also more, more, more recent uh, terrible onstage deaths as well, which can happen for, for, for so many different uh, reasons. Um, but I guess what happens when you start out and like, you know, the first few gigs you have are, are obviously go very bad and then you think, I can't do this anymore. And then you have one good one or one, you know, you might get one laugh and the feeling you get from that one is enough to propel you to keep going. And so now, I mean, obviously at this kind of stage, like almost 20 years in, the deaths are... are they're less frequent, and I definitely wanted to focus on because one of the things I hate in comedian memoirs generally is when these famous comedians tend to just write about it becomes just like a showing off thing. Here's, you know, I did this, I did this, I did this, and then I won this award. And, um, and because I'm the, the, the least, or, the, or basically the only non-famous comedian on the bookshelf in the, in the comedy section, I thought, I'm going to do the opposite, and rather than show off about anything good that's happened, not that I've done many, I just wanted to talk about all the terrible things that have happened, because I figured also, it's funnier. Um, but um, to answer your question, I mean, it, it can be tough, and it can be soul-destroying, and in the past few years, I've had plenty of times when I've literally thought about giving up, but all it takes is one to come back. I, mean, I remember one three years ago, before it was June 2019, I found a diary entry where I was, I'd had a run of bad corporate gigs, and I literally thought, I, I, I've, I've, I've lost it. I, I, this, I've, I've lost the touch. This is it. This is the moment. And I was all but ready to give up. I wasn't actively booking more gigs. And then... Um, God bless nurses, and I would say that anyway. But I went to do uh, a, a gig for a thousand nurses at the Richard Curry Center at UMB Fredericton. And I was sat there thinking, this is going to be terrible. I've been bombing night after night, and I can't believe I'm going to ruin all these, these nurses. They're heroes. And stupid old me is turning up to ruin their big night. Like, and, and, I, I mean, and so I'm sitting there, and of course, you arrive for a sound check at like 2 p.m., and you're on at like 9 p.m. That is a lot of time to be sitting there thinking, I'm a piece of dirt. I'm going to ruin nurses. I love nurses. They're the heroes, and I'm ditching here to sabotage everything. Why did I even think I... I mean, so, and thinking that the whole night, and then had a, an absolutely wonderful uh, gig, and again, uh, and at the end, again, thousand nurses standing ovation, uh, walk off stage and go, I'm the king, you know, so it's this kind of, it, it's this ridiculous roller coaster um, of, of emotions constantly, yeah, where these um, ups and downs, and sometimes it can be, um, you know, one day after the other, but um, I think the thing is, is that I genuinely love the craft, I respect the the process of it, there are always going to be bad gigs. And the, the cliche that you learn more from a bad gig than a good gig is, is true. And, um, and I, I literally, I just, I love the art form of stand-up comedy. I was obsessed with it as a child, especially as a child that was too shy to speak to other kids in his class. And then reading about, the, I would read comedian memoirs and I'd be like, well, these comedians seem as, as weird as me. They've got all the same problems. But how do they do this job where they walk out and talk to it if they're suffering with all of these insecurities and all, the, all these mental health issues and yet how do they and so I became fascinated with it as, as an art form so as a result I can kind of stay philosophical when it goes 
horribly badly and go, well, okay, what can I, what can I learn from this? And there are, always, there are always things. I mean, in the past year, I've had a couple of um, disasters where I know exactly what went wrong, you know. Um, and so it's... Yeah, I want to talk about the call of comedy because you, uh, you're from, from South London mm. and you had a job, a pretty great job interviewing people for GQ. Yeah. GQ magazine, it seemed like a pretty great, you're meeting like Sheryl Crow and it seemed like a pretty cool job, the kind of job that, you know, you read a book about, you're like, oh, how do I get that kind of... Yeah. Um, but then you, the call of comedy was so strong that like you, you, you kind of packed all that in and around the same time that you came to Canada. So... Yeah. You know, what was it like to fight it off and work at GQ? And what made you finally decide that this is what I want to go all in on? Yeah, um, it, it was it basically something that I literally was obsessed with doing from, like I say, those teenage years, but never thought I would ever have, have the strength to do it. I never thought in a million years that I, I would do it. Um, it was actually a, a teacher that told me that I, I, I could do it and should do it. Um, uh, on a, a, a sick teacher, she was, t she was my English teacher, and she uh, was told... Uh, that she only had months to live from lung cancer and came and was told she didn't have to teach us anymore and insisted that she was going to continue teaching us from her home, from her bed. And, um, and she was amazing, uh, obviously, amazing, amazing woman and continued teaching us the syllabus but also decided to teach us what she thought we should know. And she was obsessed with feminist readings of classic novels, which is why I chose to study English literature and women's studies at university in, in honor of her. And she, and she was the first person I ever confided in that I could do, that I, my dream was to try and do stand-up comedy. And it was her that first gave me that phrase, anything is possible, which was life-changing. And as twee and cliche and, and hashtag anything is possible it sounds, when you're a very depressed and, and non-functioning uh, teenager, a phrase that you've never heard before can be, can be life-changing. Um, but it still took me about 15, 20 years to, to muster the courage to even try it. And it was, it was interestingly, a trip to the Maritimes that was the, that was the, the moment that I realized I had to do it. I was, it was, I'd been uh, dating my, my then girlfriend, now wife, for four years. We'd met in the year 2000. We had visited uh, Canada every uh, year uh, since meeting. And in 2004, I'd literally fallen in love with the place. Um, and it was like my happy place. And I was both frustrated with life in London, frustrated with the, with, the, with the rat race, but also very mad at myself for not pursuing the dream and the thing that I wanted to do most. And we, it was New Year's Eve uh, 2004, and we were in the Water Street Dinner Theatre uh, in St. John, New Brunswick. And, and it was just magical. Like, the, the, these performers are up on stage, um, and they're, they're making us laugh and sing, and they're bringing us the food. And I'm like, again, now I look back, and I'm like, I mean, I, all I have to do is make an audience laugh. These geniuses have to, like, sing, do stand-up, <laughs> make sure the fries arrive to you still warm, make sure the beer arrives cold. I mean, and, I mean how do you even do that? It's just incredible. But um, I sat there watching this show and thinking, wow, these, these, these children are... It was a bit all ages, but I said, you know, these performers, they're living out their dreams. And I'm a, I'm a massive believer in that, that, that really, if you love performing, it doesn't matter in what capacity you're doing it. The, the dream is the dream. It's why I really hate uh, it, uh, hearing on TV talent shows when people, they, they make that like, the final two. And they say, you know, if I don't win this, I'm, I'm, my life is over. And I'm thinking, no, it's not. You've got an amazing voice. You've just been on TV for seven weeks. You, you can perform every night if you want, but you don't. You actually just want to be famous. You don't want to be, you know, whereas uh, for my part, I was always just wanting to perform in any capacity. And, and so looking at these performers, I'm like, they are living out their dreams. It doesn't matter that it's not Vegas. And whatever's going on in their lives during the day, they are the stars of the stage. And I enjoyed the first half of the show, then the second half was overcome with jealousy for all of those reasons. <laughs> and I'm just watching them thinking, you know, and then I was mad at myself for not, and I thought, how, how stupid am I? I'm depressed for not succeeding at a thing I haven't even tried. I'm, I, I, I'm, like, the, I'm like the classic maritimer that claims, this is my father-in-law, he always claims he never wins the lottery but never buys a ticket. <laughs> right, right. And I'm like, that's, that's who I'm being, so... Um, I made a pact that I would try stand-up that year, and it took me five months, but May uh, 2004, I, I, I did my first gig. So it was, it was a trip to, if, if you need your life changed, go to a dinner theatre in New Brunswick <laughs> or Nova Scotia, and uh, it will change your life. <laughs>
and let's uh, talk a bit about Canada, the call of Canada. So your mother had a connection, your brother has a connection here, and uh, I'm not going to steal all of your jokes, but you do have a funny bit about... Uh, what do people say to you when you tell them you've moved to the Maritimes? Yeah, it's, it, it's the, the welcome you give all new Maritimers. And I know it's still going on because there's a lot of people that have come in the last year and they tell me it's the same thing. And I think it's less prevalent, possibly, in Nova Scotia, but in New Brunswick, it, it's everyone, they, they, they meet someone that's just moved here, no one says welcome or greetings, they say, why the hell did you move here? <laughs> <laughs> And I couldn't understand it. I'm like, why are you saying that? <laughs> it's bitter like where I'm at. Look around, you've got beautiful views, friendly people, and thanks to annual flooding, waterfront mansions that cost 79 cents. <laughs> why, why are you making newcomers feel like idiots for coming here? <laughs> See, I think in Nova Scotia, there's an extra sort of, we're kind of surprised you heard of us right, right. In the, at all, right. let alone moved here. We're just, oh, you've heard of, <laughs> yes, the Halifax explosion, and we're kind of accustomed to that. I, I think it is changing. But can you talk about that, like, because your mother had a connection to BC. Your brother, I think, lives in BC. Yes. So, and, and your wife, Pam, is here Some Yes. I can't find her, but she's uh, from New Brunswick, of course. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about that call to Canada? And did she tell you the lowdown on Nancy Regan? You kind of didn't answer that question. How do you know Nancy like we do? So, yes, good point. Um, I, I knew it because I'd heard of, I mean, obviously, we would visit here every year. So she was still on TV when we were visiting. So I would see her. We're very impressed by her. And then, of course, I am so obsessed with Canada, but specifically Atlantic Canada, that I basically have watched and read and then seen every YouTube clip of every single, you know, like, I mean, I've seen, um, I've seen it all. So I've watched hours and hours of Nancy Reagan. Basically, I had to catch up with the rest of you, right? I was like, I, everything that you've all consumed in 40, 50, 60 years of, of, of living in the mountains, I wanted to consume, and I have done so in eight years. That was my, <laughs> my deep dive. Um, so yeah, there are all of these uh, connections to Canada, which are, 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 you know, obviously all just coincidences, but are incredible coincidences. Like, for example, my, my, my um, father's father um, deserted uh, my grandmother when my dad was very young and fled to, to Canada, uh, to, to BC, uh, ostensibly to work and send money home or, and, or invite them out later and was never heard from again, started a new family. Um, and weirdly, my, my, where my brother lives, my brother also, by coincidence, married a Canadian. I say coincidence, it's always copied me. So, <laughs> um, and he lives in, uh, in Vernon, BC. And weirdly, my mum, uh, when she was, uh, shortly before she met my dad, was uh, visiting BC and swam in the lake that is near my brother's house, um, which is, and, and she was, fell in love with Canada, wanted to move here, and the only reason she didn't move here was she met my dad a few weeks later in the UK. So, of course, in the parallel universe, maybe Houdini Mullinger, his, his father, had done the right thing and called for him and, 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 and my grandmother and, his, and my dad's brother. Maybe they would have met there. All these kind of little um, connections. And I think what was interesting, like, for example, when trying to form the book and trying to find a focus... I, even though I knew it was a, a memoir, I didn't want a, the book to be bogged down with needing to hit every beat of my life. What I wanted the book to be was a love letter to Atlantic Canada, a love letter to this place that I visited for the first time in, in 2000. I think one of the things that, you know, I, when Pam and I met and, and fell in love, it was, it was an amazing thing. And then I had this incredible bonus when suddenly having fallen in love, coming to this, this, this region, and, and then suddenly realizing that, my God, I'm so... Because, I mean, I to this day feel so blessed, A, to have met Pam for all of the obvious reasons, but also because I could possibly have gone my entire life without ever hearing the words New Brunswick, had... <laughs> um, and and I, could still, I could still be in England very depressed and not, you know, having not found this place. You know, I mean, Tony Soprano once said there isn't a geographical solution to an emotional problem. Well, I think there is if you move to the Maritimes. <laughs> uh, and um, so I think... What I wanted the book to be was, was a, uh, essentially a love letter to the region, but also about my journey to this place and why I fell in love with it so much. So the, really the beats and the points that I've hit upon in my childhood are all uh, th things that I think led me to fall in love with this place. So for example, you know, obviously the reason why I focused somewhat heavily on uh, the bullying and the insecurities and the problems I had at school, it's because this is the most welcoming place in the world. It is the only place in the world where, you know, newcomers are thank you. Yeah, it's true. And give yourselves a round of applause for that, because it is, it is all thanks to you. 
Um, you, you all created this place. You all created this sense of community. You created a place where newcomers, again, I mean, I know, you know, and I'm sure um, all of you have read, and if you haven't read, please read uh, John's amazing book, Peace by Chocolate, about the Haddad family. And, and you speak to, to Tarek, and you hear him talk about the way in which, and of course, you know, all of us find... As immigrants, we find our ways here through different ways, and obviously many people in their case, you know, they didn't come here necessarily by, obviously by choice, but the one thing that everyone always says is, is that it's the most welcoming place, and they cannot believe, and again, one of the most moving stories in there is, of course, the way that the, 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 the people in the town of Antigonish built uh, a chocolate shop for the Haddad family to sell their chocolate. I mean, there's nowhere else in the world that people would do that, and, and I feel like almost every immigrant tale about coming here it is that. And for my part, again, yes, I could go out and do shows, but it, I couldn't do them if people weren't telling people and spreading the word. I mean, a, a good example of this is, uh, the only reason I can tour the rest of Canada and fill venues in other parts of the country that I've never been is because when I post, for example, that I'm going to be in Ottawa or Lake Country, BC or Penticton, um, it, there's, no one, I don't, there's no one out there. What happens is, is all of the comments underneath are maritimers tagging their friends there, going, you've got to go and see this guy. He's one of us. <laughs> and, um, and I once asked Joel Plaskett what the secret of his success was. And Plaskett said that it was when he was 19, 20, he first started touring, and it was during that kind of mass exodus when everyone was leaving the maritimes, and he would go on the road, and he said it was exactly that. He would do a show in, in, in Fort Mac or wherever it was, and, and it would, all these Maritimers would come and go, and then bring everyone they worked with and go, you've got to come, this is our guy. Uh, he's one of us, one of us. He, and, then, and then these people would come and then get, you know, fall in love with Joel's work, and it would snowball. Um, anyway, so I'm, I know I'm jumping around, and I can't even remember if I've answered the question, actually. <laughs> oh, do you have the question? Well, I have a follow-up question, so it doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter. If, if you want to assemble a team of Maritime superheroes, just get your car stuck in the winter. Within seconds, yeah. they will be pushing old ladies, little children, they'll be pushing you out of the uh, I, I, Exactly, but I have exactly that story in here. Um, I did a show in uh, Miramichi with Nikki Payne, and um, there was someone's car stuck in the snow, and Nikki Payne and I were loading up all the gear, because, you know, it being, uh, being maritime comedians, of course, we, have, we're, we are also the props department, so, uh, 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 and everything else, so we're loading up all the props, and we see this van stuck, and we run over and start trying to help push this. Anyway, of course, it turns out that we know the whole family of everyone that's in the car, because maritimes. And this book, you all either have a copy or will be getting one. Uh, I read it over a couple of weeks and I've left it in my living room because it's just such a, a cheerful thing to have around. Like, I just love the picture of you on the, on the cover. He's actually wearing this t-shirt underneath all of his fancy clothes. I saw that earlier. <laughs> and it's the kind of book that you can just pick up, read a chapter. It's fun. It's funny. You'll laugh. You'll enjoy it. You'll get to know James a little better. And a lot of it is the, like the, the work you put in touring, like touring Newfoundland, like, like you, some of the TV shows you've done where it seemed like the idea of the TV show was to put you in empty bars yes. <laughs> with nobody knowing you were coming and try and be funny. So what's it been like to kind of go from Canada and the Maritimes particularly as a bit of a dream country to then you get here and it's, it's a real place and you're, you put in the work doing a lot of shows, going to a lot of places many people would never go. So what's it been like to get to know the Maritimes as a person who lives here, you have children here, you've been all over? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it really, it's, a, it's, it's a, a dream gig. As someone that is also a, a tourist here, you know, and I fell in love with this place over, you know, many, many years coming here, but then suddenly being given these opportunities to uh, arrive in towns, um, explore them, and of course, and I talk about this a lot in the book about how, but given uh, the smaller population, uh, you want people... You, I guess a, a comedian in the UK only really needs someone to come and see them maybe every five years. Whereas here, you really need people to come and want to see you a couple of times in a year. And in some cases, again, incredibly lucky, sometimes people will come three, four, five times in a year. Like, Bill Bean here, amazing man. <laughs> again, good old Bill. And thank you, Bill and Sheila. I'm you for that. And as a result, you want to make the shows uh, as, you know, you've got your, your set, but you want to make them personal. So, for example, you know, I mean, you will remember at the time in Yarmouth when um, uh, there's a place in Yarmouth called the Red Knight, uh, which is just but had the entire audience in hysterics. That this that this place. Do you know the Red Knights? It's, it's very. You know the Red Knights? Yes. The Dead Knights. The Dead Knights. <laughs> See, it's the gift that keeps on giving. 
they're, they're not, they're not, now, it's a, a considered a very, very dodgy, uh, well, it's considered a very dodgy bar. I, it, it, it isn't dodgy. This was the weird thing moving here. Coming from a place where literally uh, you could lock up a bike with a you know, $500 lock and someone would find a way to saw it off in London. <laughs> I left my, all my merch and cash box by accident in the red... Now, this is the kind of place the red night is. You leave everything in there, you forget. I left all of my merch in the red night and the cash box on a table, came back five hours later, still there. So, I mean, there's dodgy and there's dodgy, you know. Um, but so, uh, to your point, I get to go to these places explore because I'm um, legitimately fascinated. And essentially, what I've done in my time here is every single thing that I've added to my... Uh, job or my job spec from like magazine, TV show, podcast, every single thing is essentially designed just to get me into as many Atlantic Canadian towns as possible um, and, and explore for different reasons. And, and so as a result, on, on a given day, you know, there are times when, you know, I would arrive in Charlottetown uh, to, to record an episode of the debaters that night at the Confederation Centre, and then, um, but then that day, kind of drive out to Suez to, to meet Chef Michael Smith and Chastity Smith, and and, and spend a day there. So um, I, I'm just genu genuinely fascinated by the place. So it's just a, a, a dream job for someone who is literally a tourist in the place I live. And we talked earlier, I moved to Scotland to the UK in my 20s and spent most of my 20s there, and kind of for the exact opposite reasons of you, like growing up in the Maritimes, by the time I hit my early 20s, I was kind of like, I don't want to run into my uncle and my cousin every time I walk out the door. I want to walk down a street where nobody knows me and nobody makes eye contact with me. So when you were talking about the London transit system on your, your great special sold out Harborview Arena, is that what it's called, sold out? Yeah. I was like, that sounds beautiful. You could just go to work, nobody would talk to you. So I, I got it out of my system. I did come home, so I think I missed it in the end. But um, yeah, can you talk about your personality, and from, especially from London, which is, you know, the center of the world, at least uh, in many ways, a bustling, busy, international place. So how have you adjusted your personality, your self? Are you one of those sort of Canadians born on foreign soil and you've found a home here? I, I think so. In the, I mean, I definitely, like I said, like really value the concept of community. And, and, and so coming from a place where no one speaks to their neighbours, no one, you know, there is no sense of community. Uh, I love the, the, you know, the fact that we say hello to each other in the streets, whereas literally in England, I mean, people will lock you up for that. They will think you're certified <laughs> insane. Just for, um, so those things, those little... Uh, traits uh, of this place are things that I think you know, definitely attracted me to it. Um, I mean, there is something to be said for the for the you know anonymity of, of of obviously in London. I mean, the fact that, but of course, what it does is it creates a system whereby people can people behave appallingly because there's no comeback. And it's a weird thing. You, you know, I mean, what you the behaviour you see on the tube train in the morning. Two people look perfectly respectable. They probably are perfectly decent people. One of them nudges the other. It turns into a big pushing and shouting match, and everyone's effing and blinding, and they're getting off at the same tube stop, but they know they will never see each other ever again, even though they probably work 30 seconds from each other. Whereas what I like here is, even though I, I do get the Maritimers are inherently nice, but you also don't have a choice to be, right? <laughs> like, I mean, and, and it's, and it's a, a great thing. Like, I remember once, um, and I realized it's quite great, I was in a, a Cineplex uh, lineup in St. John, and the line was very long and slow, and I uh, tutted. Right, and again, before I realised, it tutted. Uh, my wife got a text message from someone that she went to high school with saying that I was kicking off at the Cineplex <laughs> because I tutted. Now, now, now uh, that realisation, uh, and I had another one where we had um, a bad experience with a contractor and we went out for dinner that night and we were sitting at the table and I started slagging off this contractor who, who'd caused us all... Anyway, it turned out I was sat next to his sister. <laughs> and, and I quickly realised we literally have to be, we have to be nice. And, and it's a wonderful thing. It's a good thing that, that, that we've all been um, uh, uh, trained this way. And it's kind of like, and it, it kind of means, for example, that road rage is less of a thing. Like in, in England, no one thinks twice about giving someone the finger. Whereas I just know in St. John, if I kind of went, I, I mean, I did once almost do it and then realised it was the mayor who I also know socially. And, and you just realise that you, and so that was, I think, the biggest thing of going, okay, we, we get to be nice here. And of course, we have more reasons to be, and we're less stressed here. Um, but I feel like, I guess what it is, is, it, is that we make people accountable here, because we are all accountable for our actions here. And I feel like anonymity in a place like London makes people l less accountable. I mean, for example, I mean, the amount of, and they could just use a, a really gross example, like the stench 
in London streets uh, in the morning, well, especially like the, the, the drunkenness and, and so forth that you see in public. But the amount of, again, respectable people you just see standing in the street urinating uh, in an evening because they, they, they just don't, they, you know, they're drunk, they don't care. Whereas I think, feel like here, even if someone was tempted to urinate, they'd be like, if I do that, I will bump into someone I know. <laughs> You know, not that I'm, I'm not saying I've ever been tempted to publicly. <laughs> well, what do you miss about London? Being able to piss in the streets. That's what I really miss. <laughs> I, I can fill you in on, on the, the spaces if you need them. I, I, had a, a, <laughs> I had a global, I had a global TV uh, live interview once, at like 7:30 in the morning for a book. Super nervous, took the bus in. That did not help things. Jostling around in there. By the time I got off the bus, I realized that in the next 30 minutes I was going to throw up. So was I going to throw up on their studio or? And I found the Gottingen Street Police Station. There's a little bit behind there you can tuck in. <laughs> I don't think anybody sees you, as far as I know. I mean, I mean, but how amazing, like, that would have gone down in Maritime's TV history had you done it on air. Can you imagine? That could have made me. That could have and made that would me. Have been, uh, that would have been quite a moment. And we've got about 10 or 15 minutes left for this part, and then you're going to do a reading, and we're going to take some questions from you. Um, so one of the things you said earlier was you touched on being famous and the difference between wanting to do the work and being famous. But I thought just reading your book and watching your, your performances, there's something about like as a Maritimer myself, as a Nova Scotian, like definitely in the 90s, it felt like you had to leave. Like any self-respecting Nova Scotian had to leave, even if it was just for a year. You had to go somewhere else and then come back. And so that's probably why I went to Edinburgh. But I think part of that is like feeling like, is succeeding here really success? But the way you portray it, it's like, well, these are your friends and your colleagues and the people who work at the stores that you see. So why wouldn't you want to be celebrated by them and be famous in their eyes rather than a whole bunch of people who you don't know. So can you talk a bit about being famous, that sort of big thing, and then being well-known and, and, you know, yeah. locally famous? I, and I, well, I guess the, the, I guess the wonderful thing with the Maritimes is that everyone's famous because everyone knows everyone. It's just everyone's famous for different things. So, like, so, you know, someone is going to be famous because they famously got their tongue stuck to a frozen lamppost when they were 11 and made the front page of the newspaper. So everyone's kind of known for something, and, and you really want to manage what that thing is. Like, because... <laughs> When I moved here, I discovered how people get, get how people don't forget things. So, like, people, so I would be like, oh, what's that guy? Oh, that's him. He got in a fight in 88 with, uh, <laughs> whoa, you've got long memories here. Like, I mean, I was a real learning curve. Like, you really can't make any mistakes. Like, you've got to, um, and I think, I mean, I guess it, it all depends what people are chasing. Like, like, for my mind, again, my dream, my ridiculous pipe dream was always, uh, how do I, uh, find a way to uh, put food on a t feed a family doing stand-up comedy, which already is a ridiculous... Of, of the people that say they want to do it, probably 0.1% of people get to do it, and then how do you stay there? Um, and again, when I moved here, obviously after why the hell did you move here, people <laughs> then said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a comedian, and everyone went, oh, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, you can't do that here, no, no. N nothing to laugh about in New Brunswick, no. You've got to go out west if you want to do the jokey jokes, nothing. And, um, and, and it basically what a lot of people said was, all the Canadian comedians in London said to me, you know, A, they were, like, they were like, the Canadian comedy scene's dead, you can't, you can't do anything there, you have to live on chicken wings, uh, there's no... And, 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 and these were comedians from Montreal and Toronto. And then they said, where are you moving? Montreal, Toronto. I said, no, no, uh, New Brunswick. They were like, what? <laughs> um, and they were like, that just won't happen. And I, 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 this is testament to how much I wanted to give my children uh, a Maritime's upbringing, was that I was... I did not know I was going to be able to carry on. It was not, not only was it not a career move, the plan was to maybe occasionally go back to London and do stand-up, maybe occasionally go to Toronto and do some yuck yuck shows, but I never, people, everyone said it wasn't going to be possible um, to do it, and so it all kind of happened somewhat organically. There was no game plan. Um, and to use the plumber analogy, it is a weird thing when people say, oh, there's no comedy in that place, don't go there, because you wouldn't say to a plumber, oh, there's no plumbers in that town. Don't go there. It's like, if there's no plumbers there, there's a lot of shitty toilets that need unblocking. <laughs> so that plumber's going to... So I like to see myself as the toilet unblocker of comedy, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, 
and so I, not that I, I and, and I talk about this as if I saw it as some huge opportunity. I didn't. I didn't think this is what I'm going to do. I just got here, started doing what a plumber would do, which is do a couple of jobs. People would tell people, and it literally started like that. I did shows. I, I remember being at my um, mother, my, my my wife's uh, parents' house on the Kingston Peninsula, and there was an article about us moving that home but, uh, slash there in the newspaper, and a guy that owns a vineyard phones me up uh, and says, hi, I own a vineyard on the peninsula, would you like to do a show here? And my English comedian brain went, that won't work, you can't, that won't work, outdoors in a vineyard. That, but then I thought, well, I've got no other work, you know, and he, he said, I'll pay you 200 bucks, and I was like, 200, and he was like, uh, he, he said 200 bucks, and I said 250, he went 200, I'm like, deal. Uh, that's that, that's what, <laughs> what happens when you don't have an agent. And, um, and we went and did this show, and basically, to cut a long story short, went and did a show to, you know, 20 people, they liked it, they told people, and it literally happened very quickly. That was like May, June to 2014. Over that summer, those show, that show of 20 people on a kind of weekly basis built to about 300, who then told enough people that by October I'd filled the Imperial Theatre in St. John, which is an 800 seater, and I'd never on my own had played a venue that big in the UK. Like I'd never sold one out solo. So it was literally six months of being in a place where word of mouth. So the only person, and I mentioned this in, in, in my acknowledgements at the back of the book, the only person who, who actually thought there was any possibility that I might be able to find any work as a comedian here was the Canadian comedian Catherine Ryan, who is amazing, and you should buy her book. It's called The Audacity and watch her stand-up special on Netflix. She um, left, uh, she was from Sarnia. She famously worked at Hooters in uh, Toronto. And one night on the way back from Hooters, walked past the Yuck Yucks, thought I'd have a go. Anyway, for various reasons, uh, moved her to London. Her story is incredible. She's now one of the biggest stars in British comedy. Absolute superstar, multimillionaire, super famous, absolutely just, and, and amazing. She was the only person, and she was not, she was not well known at the time. She was not famous at this point. But she was the one that said to me, don't believe what they tell you about Canadian comedy. She said, don't listen to the gatekeepers who tell you that you've got to audition for this club chain, you've got to play this festival, you need to do a Just For Love Scarlet. She's like, there's a reason why that, that people want you to believe that system. She said, there's an underground independent system that you won't read about, that you won't hear about, but you can do that. And she was like, navigate it yourself and you'll be fine. And she was the only person that said that. And that was literally what I decided to do, was essentially create, uh, create a circuit where there wasn't one, of, of simply educating people that uh, stand-up comedy was something that they might enjoy. And invariably, the thing that I probably hear the most is people saying that either that they thought they didn't like stand-up or they'd never been to a show before. And, um, and I just think that there's an amazing movement within the Maritimes right now of this education of people. For example, one of the main investors of the Atlantic Ballet of Canada, uh, one of the main bank rollers, is someone who, uh, 20 years ago, when Susan Sharma's Gauvin and uh, Igor Dobrovsky approached him about it, he said, I hate ballet. And now, and she said, well, have you ever seen ballet? And, and then they edu he saw ballet, fell in love, and now he is the uh, main investor. Similarly, someone like Misha Booger Gossman, uh, Misha Booger Gossman Lee, sorry, as she is now married uh, to a wonderful man. Um, she... Um, she, she has educated people who maybe thought they didn't like opera. And I feel like that is this incredible thing. And again, I mean, again, look at, the, look at this library. One of the most beautiful libraries in the world is in the mountains. Can we just give it up for, for Cheryl and Scott and everyone here at Halifax uh, Central Library for letting us in here tonight? I mean, this was... This opened shortly after we moved here. We moved in February 2014. This opened, of course, in December uh, 2014. Seeing this architectural marvel in this place was one of the reasons we said we need to start a magazine to educate people in other parts of Canada that the Maritimes is where it's at and also remind the people who keep saying, why the hell did you move here, <laughs> that they are very blessed to be in this place. <laughs> and, uh, for the, and that's Edit Magazine. Uh, you can sign up for the... Is it bi-weekly? You get an email which gives you a whole list of things. It's a great thing. I have one last question for you. Um, so, does anybody here know somebody who has outsold Jerry Seinfeld? It's a trick question, because you do. James Mullinger outsold Jerry Seinfeld at the Harborview... Once. Harbor One. Station. Harbor, Harbor Station, thank you. Once. Well, well, actually, I say that twice, but, but I mean, this is not... <laughs> but this is not, a, this is not an ongoing thing. It's just once in one... Twice in one city. So, my wife and I downloaded Plex onto our TV last night, uh, and we got to watch your stand-up special for free, so Plex if you need it. And what really struck me is, first off, I was like, 
Good God, that's a lot of people. That's a huge 2,000 plus sold out arena. I mean, it was. 5,000. 5,000. And packed to the gills. And what I loved, like in the book and in, in your podcast, you talk about how the reason you out sold Jerry Seinfeld when they asked you about that is you said, well, were you out handing around, handing around those flyers, flyers yeah. on your way to the park? And, and also the last thing I'll leave you with is that when I saw you up there, there's several comedians, Canadian comedians in China who speak Mandarin. And so they perform in Mandarin and people in China, just, it's just sort of a, uh, such a strange experience. And I kind of feel you have a little bit of that too, to hear your English accent, but to hear you doing specifically New Brunswick jokes that are so specific that even me, as a, as a Nova Scotian, I felt like an outsider. I was like, God, I gotta go to New Brunswick more often. I don't know what you're talking about. It so can you talk about that show and that sort of culmination of selling, selling 5,000? And I know, I know the comedian you mean, the Canadian comedian from Ottawa, who, uh, again, this is, I guess this is the one thing about Canada, the second biggest country in the world. But actually, I joke about it being small in, in the Maritimes. But really, the whole, that, that Canadian comedian who is massive in China is like the biggest superstar in China. Um, I was on a stage with him in Ottawa like three weeks ago. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, of course. Uh, again, I was going to say only in the Maritimes, but only in Canada. Um, I mean, those shows were obviously like, a, you know, a, a, a dream come true. The first one stemmed from a, a CBC documentary that we were making called City on Fire, where um, a CBC wanted to do a, sto- a, a, a documentary about uh, what was happening in St. John and what, really what, what was happening with the city and was it kind of having a, uh, something of a renaissance. And so they wanted it through this newcomer's eyes, which was me. Um, and I would interview people about uh, people that were involved in, in urban planning and all kinds of different things and, and architects. But I wanted it to have, I, I knew we would get kind of one hit at this. CBC weren't going to come back and say, let's do another St. John documentary. So I also wanted to give people a reason to watch it that weren't, from, I wanted to give it a, a narrative that would make people watch it that had no interest in St. John. So uh, uh, Lachlan, the director of, of, of the documentary, had the idea. He said, as a, he's, as a joke almost, he's like, why don't you try and sell out Harbour Station? And I'm like, well, that's a good idea. And so I'd basically been here for, I'd been here for two years, and it was decided essentially, and I just actually played that Imperial Theatre for a second time. So I'd just done another 800-seater uh, uh, the, the, the following year with a new show. So again, and I give these numbers because it is, when you're you in a city of a population of like 90,000, it's, it's a high proportion of people that, that you, it's slim pickings, really, is what I'm saying, <laughs> of, 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 of audience. And, um, and so that was in October, and then it was decided that in April I was going to try and do this thing. So what we did was essentially rally the city and say, look, the last documentary about St. John that CBC did was about a group of amazing people trying to save the Paramount Theatre. And it was this a beautiful, inspiring film about this beautiful old theatre called the Paramount, and it was uh, St. John, uh, um, St. John just community-minded people working and toiling to save the Paramount. And the final scene of the documentary was the Paramount being knocked down. <laughs> so I was almost able to somewhat, I guess, leverage that and go, please, please, St. John, don't let the second ever CBC documentary <laughs> about St. John be me walking out on stage in an empty arena. <laughs> um, but people got behind it. And people, but yes, and I literally went around handing out flyers. And, J- J- and, and I knew Jerry Seinfeld from uh, um, years before. I will tell that story in a sec. But um, his, his publicist wrote to me to congratulate me. And, and he said, you know, so you, you beat Jerry's number. And of course, there are many uh, stipulations to this, which people will always point out. You know, obviously, my tickets were cheaper. Obviously, uh, there were, uh, I, I gave lots of tickets to uh, charities to sell so they could fundraise. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't beat Jerry. So I did not make as much money as Jerry Seinfeld made from playing other stations. Is what I'm... And obviously, you got twice the last that Jerry Seinfeld well, did. Well, well, uh, not, not for me to say, but a CBC journalist just said it. So... Uh, I'm putting that on the poster. Thanks, John. Thank God we're recording this. <laughs> um, and so, to, so that first time, it kind of felt like this, this amazing thing. And, and we did fill it. And Jerry's publicist wrote to say congratulations. And he said, how did you do it? And I said, well, put it this way. Yeah, did you have Jerry on the ground for six months handing out flyers outside every school, playground, every... And, uh, and that was, that was how, how it was done. And then, but then can, weirdly, and it was actually... Um, the architect, Monica Adair, who was in that documentary, had said to me, she said, you've got to stop thinking about this as the pinnacle. This isn't, this isn't your make-a-wish moment. This is just the first, this is your first arena show. It's not, it's not 
this is not... Th 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 so anyway, so then I, two years to the day later, I uh, did it again, which I think is to show you what's uh, almost Canadian, um, which again turned over a whole new uh, show for it. And, uh, and we did it again and broke the previous record. But again, all down to uh, just people in the maritimes getting behind uh, a, a crazy immigrant that comes here, has a crazy idea, and everyone goes, okay, well, that sounds ridiculous, but how can we help? And it's the only place in the world where people will do that. Hi, Eric. All right, that, that brings us to 8 o'clock. You are the piece by chocolate of stand-up comedy. That's a good way to describe yourself. <laughs> <coughs> so James is going to read for us now, so let's, uh, let's hear what you've got. But let's give him a round of applause first. Oh, James well, Mullinger, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for John. John, everyone. Let's see, I have my Canada socks on. Always wearing Canada socks. I, I, I learned that from Tarek, actually. I interviewed uh, Tarek uh, in Antigonish. And again, it's quite amazing. I mean, you would have experienced this many times. Walking around Antigonish with, with Tarek Haddad is, is I don't know, it's, it's like walking around anywhere else with, like, Brad Pitt. <laughs> like, just, just people just coming and bowing him. And, and again, he had these amazing Canada socks on. And uh, he had obviously recently passed his... Um, uh, citizenship test and got 20 out of 20. I only got 19. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so I will read um, a couple of things. I want to read the, uh, the, the first paragraph of the book and I will, I will jump around a bit. Um, this is the first sentence of the book. Perhaps I was always meant to be a Canadian. I wanted that to be the first sentence in my book because that's the first sentence I've written as a Canadian citizen. That's right. I swore my oath here at my desk just moments ago. Exciting, eh? <laughs> See what I did there? The ceremony is already having an effect on me. Despite this being the beginning of the book, these are really the last words I will write before this tome is published. It's an odd feeling being here at the end and also about to begin the story, but it's fitting as well because I'm sitting here as a newly minted Canadian reflecting on the journey that brought me to this place. I'm looking forward and back at the same time, which coincidentally is how this book begins. And um, at that point, I go into the, uh, the Canadian history that we talked about before. Um, I will now uh, start the opening. This is the actual first chapter. Um, this is set at Heathrow Airport, and I decided to uh, read this because my uh, oldest son, Hunter, who, who is here tonight, is possibly the only person in the room who was at Heathrow Airport in London this morning, uh, having just spent two weeks uh, with uh, my parents in England, and he flew in, uh, literally was up at, I believe, 1 a.m. our time, and, uh, and he's here now. Uh, so, Hunter. Good on you. Um, anyway, so um, here we go. It's called The Gate. No matter what you're looking for in life, you will not find it at Heathrow Airport. <laughs> you can be early, you can be late, you can bid farewell or be reunited, but in the churning anonymous throng of humanity that is Heathrow, you are neither here nor there. The good life is beyond you or behind you, and you are in between. I've endured hundreds of drives to Heathrow over the previous 20 years. I've been tired, stressed, hungover, elated, excited, nervous, apprehensive, wired. But this is the first trip I can describe as being objectively terrifying, gut-wrenchingly so. It is Valentine's Day 2014. The drive itself is uneventful, as it always is. Everyone knows the real drama occurs before or after any trip to the airport. But my insides are swirling and my brain is on high heat. The woman and two children by my side have no idea of this, as I exude a calm veneer. I'm used to this. My job is pulling the wool over people's eyes as to what is going on inside me. I spend a lot of time in airports for both of my jobs, but this time is different. I'm not traveling alone, and I won't return in a few days hungover, jet-lagged, and elated, or depressed after killing or dying in front of a live audience. No, I'm an entirely rational human being in my late 30s who has climbed the journalistic ranks to become both the comedy editor and the photography director for British GQ, and who has built up a successful stand-up career in one of the most competitive cities on the planet. And here I am, my wife and young children beside me, leaving it all behind. Now, the logical observer would understandably assume that I'm relocating to ply my trade and British charm under the bright, I don't, I think, um, I think, thank you. I think the editor added British charm. I wouldn't have written that about myself. <laughs> Fight for the arrogant. 
um, to ply my, uh, ply my trade, I would say, uh, under the bright lights of New York or Los Angeles. But the logical observer would be wrong. In fact, I am moving to a place the logical observer couldn't find on a map without asking Google for help. <laughs> Farewell salad cream, Marmite, London pubs, fish and chips. Farewell Paddington Station, prawn cocktail crisps, being able to perform half a dozen gigs in one night. Farewell public transport, Cornish pasties, Bond Street, deep fried Mars bars, Big Ben. Farewell Spotted Dick. I should point out, <laughs> Spotted Dick is a, is a pudding dessert. <laughs> I, I wasn't saying farewell, Spotted Dick, because I'd just been given a cream. <laughs> it wasn't just healing on the way to the... Uh, <laughs> it's a dessert. Uh, I'm leaving you all behind and moving to what some people have told me is the middle of nowhere. My wife Pam is standing there clutching River. We had a late night and were up criminally early and are both riddled with anxiety, but she still looks beautiful, collected, her long blonde hair impeccably straightened by 5 a.m. before the rest of us surfaced for our final night's sleep in London. Pam grew up in St. John, New Brunswick, a small port city on the shores of the Bay of Fundy on Canada's east coast. She escaped small town life the first chance she got when she was 17 and moved to Toronto where she lived for eight years before following her best friend Kyla to the city of her dreams. Pam's grandmother was English, a war bride who moved to New Brunswick decades earlier, but who never forgot to regale Pam throughout her childhood with stories of the South London wartime spirit, the drinking, the singing, the drinking. <laughs> and Pam's dream was to live in London and work for her hero, Tyler Brulé, a Canadian magazine magnet. Um, long story short, uh, she went to London, applied her maritime work ethic, and within one year, uh, without any magazine experience, uh, was poached by Tyler Brulé to work for his company. So... <laughs> but now, but then suddenly, uh, out of the blue, for reasons that will be uh, outlined in this chapter, uh, we, uh, we upped and left, and I don't think anyone uh, expected it. One of, the only, one of the things I was actually, I should have mentioned, when I met Seinfeld the year before, um, he gave me, there was a piece of advice that he gave me, which, I mean, I'm not, that, I'm not saying I moved here just because of this, but it was the year before, and I, we had, I was like, directing a, a video for GQ's iPad edition, and it was like a dream to be in a room with Seinfeld and be interviewing him and, and all this. But at the end of the interview, I asked him a question that I've always wondered. Something just as always, it wasn't part of the, what I was supposed to ask, but I just, I just had to ask. And I said, look, can you just tell me, you know, off the record, I said, like, why did you quit the sitcom, your sitcom Seinfeld, when you did. I said it was at its, its cultural peak, its commercial peak, its critical peak. You clearly hadn't run out of ideas. Uh, you and Larry David had clearly had loads more ideas. The network wanted more. They were offering you more money than God to, to, to do another season. The fans wanted more. Why not do just one more season? And he paused and, and he looked me in the eye. And it's a weird thing when you're in front of your hero and he's just staring you in the eye. And he said, uh, he said that's simple, James. He said, because that's what everybody expected me to do. And then he said, he said, there's a good life lesson for you, a good career lesson. He said, make a list of all the things everybody expects you to do and do the opposite. And eight months later, I was on a plane to St. John, New Brunswick. To... Um, uh, so I jump ahead and, and I describe, obviously, our final night. And really how, I mean, they say the most stressful thing in life is, you know, moving house, having a baby, changing jobs. Uh, we were doing all three uh, and moving countries at the same time. And also, I, mean, I should point out, I mean, I guess, and I guess this does come across in the book, but I hadn't really dawned on me that we really didn't have, not only were we leaving behind established things and jobs with, with benefits and, and friends and family, and, uh, we didn't have a plan here. I mean, we, I mean that, it's funny, look back at it and people go, oh, that's so strong. It was stupid. Like, we just had... A second child, and we are literally, and, and the only thing that we knew we had in place here was obviously Pam's family here, so it was free childcare on tap. That was, that was, that was the thing. We had no uh, plan for, for, for work. I mean, we knew we were going to maybe do freelance stuff for people back in the UK, but we had nothing in place. So, um, it's, uh, anyway, th this is where we're at. This is, the end of the, this is the end of an era, and possibly the biggest mistake of our lives. 
uh, and we go back, uh, da, da, da. in the morning, this is the morning we leave, I receive a text message from my comedy agent, Alex Jarrett, who lives in Northampton. He's vowed to stay my agent in Canada and do what he can for me there, but he doesn't know anyone east of Quebec, so I know full well this is a pipe dream. The best of intentions, but a pipe dream. Two days earlier, we'd been, we'd been in the Midlands together, as I did my final show as a resident of the UK. It was a show I'd been touring and planned to return to tour later that year, since I knew there was no work for me in Canada, so, and we staged it at the prestigious Leicester Comedy Festival. The show went well, and we had a sad parting farewell. Alex had worked hard to get me to this point, late nights driving me around the country, arguing with promoters to book me, cheering me up after bad gigs, trying to calm me down after good gigs, and doing everything he could to make me a proper comedian, and all the while doing it for very little money. Now we've finally reached touring level and sold out shows, and I'm leaving. His text was just a photo from the Leicester Mercury newspaper, a full page review of Tuesday's show. I dread reading reviews because the criticism always hurts, but this one hurt even more because it was the best review I'd ever received. I had set out to become a good stand-up, and here was the proof that I finally was, and the final lines of the review stung the most. Bravo, James Mullinger, you certainly have our attention. After almost a decade of trudging around and toiling on stage almost nightly, I finally had their attention, but now I was moving to a place without a comedy industry to speak on. They speak of, would I ever get to do it again? Um, I will jump ahead. There's more in that chapter. It's very good, it's very good. <laughs> I was enjoying reading it by myself. I, did, I was worried about time. Uh, I, I, I was literally just went through my mind. This is how I, I literally was like, I don't remember that. I, why did I put that in? Um, oh, anyway, well, maybe I'll finish this chapter. Um, um, uh, Pam is leaving her best friend, who she saw at least once a week, and a career she worked hard to achieve. And I'm leaving, well, everything I've ever known. Though I can honestly say I will not miss Heathrow. Air travel used to be glamorous. I imagine it still is for those traveling on private planes, or maybe it's just functional for them, I don't know. But for us plebs, it's an ordeal. No one enjoys it. It's a necessary evil. But right now I'm in a daze, overwhelmed by the scents and sounds that circle me like an overenthusiastic June bug. The clattering of suitcase wheels and smell of stale sweat and rotten nicotine smoke blended brutally in equal measure with the panic, despair, joy and excitement that surrounded us. Richard Curtis was right. Love is all around in an airport, but there's a hell of a lot polluting it too. <laughs> we are checked in and walking to security. The smells get worse. My panic level wouldn't be any higher if I had a kilo of heroin up my bottom. <laughs> That, 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 that was our business plan. That was what it was. That was what I mean. I was like, maybe we just invest in a kilo of heroin and maybe there'll be a demand in St. John. Uh, but this is the right thing to do, isn't it? A small part of me hopes that they find something counterfeit buried in me and force me to stay. Maybe I should have thought of that sooner. But here we are through security without any issues. Here we go. Um, do I have time for one more? Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I just don't want to keep everyone. I'm very appreciative, by the way. I never, I mean, it's one of the things I, I hope I kind of convey in the book that I think one of the things I never stop take, taking for granted is the reason why I put so much work into those big shows is it's that thing of like, I know how hard it is to get out of the house, park, babysit. And also, the thing is, in the Maritimes, is you are competing with way more. Like in London, someone books a ticket for a show. Yes, there's other stuff going on, but in the Maritimes, the distractions are way more tempting. Like as a comedian, I am not competing necessarily with other comedians. I'm competing with Cousin Donny at the camp, who is, <laughs> who is way funnier than, than me. And, and, and you're all around the campfire in the afternoon, and you're like, we've got tickets for that, 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 that comedian, James Wellen, just like, yeah, but Donny's making us laugh our asses off. Why would we leave to go and, and see so you're constantly competing with that? So I really appreciate you all being here. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, actually, maybe I'll read uh, this bit, which is about, actually, well, on that point. This, uh, talking about the, the work I put into making shows specific, uh, this is a story about one of my favorite places in the world, Pictou County. Um, and you think, I'm not being sarcastic. Uh, <laughs> I, 
I find, I find Picto h- hilarious. You know, and, uh, because, because those six towns won't amalgamate, and as a result, they all, but they're all at war with each other. So, like, they've got their six mayors, which, but that means there's, like, six separate Christmas parades. But then they, or they will change their parade to the day of the other one to force people to choose between them. I don't know what it is. Picto County is like South African era of apartheid, the way that they're... It's, 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 it's weird, and it's, it's wonderful, but I, I, I played there a lot, and I played the Glasgow Square Theatre uh, in, uh, in New Glasgow numerous times, and, and had a great time the first time, and I, I outline all of this. Um, but basically, in uh, 2019, I, it didn't feel great. Like, I'd had, I'd had great years, and I went back, and I felt like maybe... Uh, I didn't put as much work in it as I had on the local research. So I was determined. And for me, whenever I bomb in a place, I have to exercise that demon somehow. And it's never exercised until you do. Like, if you bomb in a venue, you've got to go back. And, or if someone sees you bomb, like, that's the worst thing, where a friend or a family member says, uh, we're coming to see you, and they come, and, and then you bomb, and afterwards they don't want to make eye contact. <laughs> And, 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 and they're like, uh, uh. the worst one is when someone says, uh, you know, this is when you know you've bombed, when someone goes, did you enjoy that? <laughs> that that's people's way of saying, and, and, and so you then, you then, I had the whole thing filed in my head of people who might have seen me bomb, and it's like, they need to see me do well, otherwise it's never been exercised. So I needed to exercise the demons of uh, 2019 and 2020. So this time in 2020, this was obviously February before, uh, um, I decided to do a special show for Picto. That meant I did some research, real research, like university degree research. My friend, the author, Sarah Butland, who lives nearby, gave me lots of local news tips that helped form jokes made especially for Picto County. And and this, to my point, is the thing about trying to, you know, you want people to come. If someone comes to see a comedian and they come twice and they see the same show twice, they will never come again. So it is constantly trying to prevent that. And, And I think also... Um, as you touched upon earlier, when you are uh, joking, I, I sometimes wonder, obviously a lot of my jokes, I'm not, I mean, all of the, the, the jokes about the region are done in, and infused with love, but I sometimes wonder if, uh, if I was a British comedian just passing through, if I could get away with saying as many things as I do, but I think it's because people know that I've, it's done with, with, with so much love, so... Um, Here we go. I learned, for instance, that Ming's Chinese had reopened after being closed in 2016. So Ming's Chinese is where Ming's Chinese used to be. (laughs) It was beautiful. And so I get told this, and I'm like, this is is gold. And sure enough, brought the house down. Um, I, I, I learned over social media that the dry ribs were no longer on the menu and that people were really upset about it. So I worked that into the show. Um, I learned that because there's six towns within Picto with their own councils and mayors and tree lightings, often on the same day to compete with each other, they have the most politicians per capita in Canada. And any talk of amalgamating the six municipal units in Picto County was highly controversial. So I decided to go full throttle with it. <laughs> I joke that they have so many politicians that even their country singers are in politics. Uh, I I didn't didn't know if you would all know that. I do explain it for readers. uh, uh, You see, Canadian country music star George Canyon had recently been uh, been the Conservative Party of Canada candidate for the riding of Central Nova. So I asked, who's next? Dave Gunning? He's already the Prince of Picto County. Is he allowed to be the bloody mayor too? I should also point out, and this is true, I, I, just I should also point out that I joked at this same gig, February 2020, I joked that at this rate, the local MLA, Tim Houston, would be the next premier of Nova Scotia. <laughs> sure, I was pandering, but it created a lovely atmosphere, everyone laughed, and then in August 2021, in a surprise landslide, Houston was elected premier. I know, I'm a sage. And a few months later, this happened, I was hosting an awards ceremony at the, it was a tourism awards ceremony at the Decost Performing Arts Centre in Picto. And who walks on stage, to, I, and I, I obviously had the script, I'm reading the, the thing, and I have to work on stage, Premier Houston comes on stage. And uh, amazingly, uh, he had heard this, he had heard that I'd said this, and he walked on stage and said, uh, and said to the audience, he said, James Mullinger was definitely the only person that saw this coming. <laughs> Uh, 
and final thing, um, best of all, I discovered that Stella, I mean, this is how much I, I dig deep for material. Um, best of all, I discovered that Stellaton, one of the towns in Pictou County, had not updated its bylaws since 1920. <laughs> it was like mining gold. <laughs> These are all actual bylaws in Stellaton. Um, Curfews. An alarm, ordinarily known as the fire alarm, shall be sounded twice at nine o'clock each evening and shall be known as the curfew alarm. No boy or girl under the age of 15 shall be or remain on in any street or public place of the town of Stellaton um, after the said curfew unless accompanied by one of his or her parents. No person shall feed any horse on any street <laughs> except by a nose bag. No person should fasten any horse or other beast to any tree on any street. And on it went. And I went into the show feeling like I was armed to the teeth with great local content. And this is what I endeavor to do at every show. Make each show unique and special so the audiences never see the same show twice. So we do have a few more minutes for questions. I can see people are stretching and ready to get their legs going, but we'll, we'll, do you guys have some questions? If you want, I don't know if there's a mic going around, but how about you ask a question and I'll repeat it into the mic. Uh, we'll go, yeah. Oh, there's a mic coming your way. I believe it's the owner of the Red House back there. That was brilliant, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. My question is, you said that you got 19 out of the 20 questions right on the citizenship <laughs> test. What was the one you got wrong? That is a good question. Um, I, you, you, they don't tell you, but weirdly, I think I know which one it was. And it is, it's incredibly embarrassing uh, because it relates to the homeland. It was, um, who is Canada's head of state? <laughs> And, and I, I honestly, and it was weird, like I know everything from like, I know that one of the other questions was the lieutenant, the, the lieutenant governor of New Brunswick is this amazing lady, uh, Brenda Murphy, who lives in Grand Bay Westfield. That was one of the questions was, was where she lives, Grand Bay Westfield. I got that right, but I did not know the queen was the head of state. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, so that, I think that's the one I got wrong. <laughs> Good question. Yes, uh, we have one in the front row. Hi, Val. Hi, James. A <laughs> bit of a serious question, but do you think that the Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock ev uh, experiences I've had has changed comedy and did it affect you at all? Good question. Um, it, 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 it affected me in that I hate getting asked about it. <laughs> but I kept getting, I kept getting asked. But so, so I tell you, so an interesting thing that happened with... Um, I read about this in, uh, and heard about this from, from British comedians, that, that they say that post-COVID, British audiences have become uh, far more uh, aggressive, less respectful to the craft. They're finding that, you know, I mean, again, you expect comedy clubs to be quite heckly and drunk, but touring comedians in theatres are saying that they're having a lot of people kind of shouting. Um, I think the, I mean, the, the Chris... Those two incidents, obviously, I mean, you would hope that the things that come out of that is venues upping their security. Um, it's very strange that they both happen so close together because I don't think that in any way it was anything to do with, um, you know, I don't think it really has anything to do with what you can say and what you can't say. I think it's, uh, yeah, security should be up, certainly. Um, and I also think, of course, that everyone should be able to do their job, whether they're a, a, a comedian or frontline worker or... Uh, whatever anyone's doing, they should be um, protected from, from the threat of violence. The, the debate as to what is kind of acceptable in comedy kind of always rages on. Um, and uh, I, I personally choose to make my comedy uh, completely 
inclusive. And that is just, you know, that's not to say that I don't want to challenge people. And it's not to say, and I think that sometimes I do, and sometimes I like to push the envelope maybe. But what I never want to do is make a single person in, in, a, in a room, if someone has gone to all the trouble to you know, get babysitter to come out, buy a ticket, I don't want one person to sit there and feel hurt by one joke. Now, there are comedians that specialize in that, and people like it, and they should absolutely be allowed to apply their trade, and people should be allowed to go and laugh at it. Uh, a lot of the time, the people that complain about those jokes are the people who go and sit there and laugh about every single offensive thing under the sun, but as soon as there's one joke that affects them, then they're shot. Um, you know, I, I, I don't like some of that comedy, uh, so I don't go and watch it. Should it exist? Absolutely. Uh, and, and everyone should be allowed to choose what they watch. Um, whereas, you know, to my mind, I think of the audience as, as my boss, and that's kind of why, in my act, I am the butt of every joke. Like, and I quite careful in thinking about that. Like, I always look, who is the target here? And it is always, invariably, me and my stupidity. Um, you know, the thought of someone coming... And some comedians live by the mantra of, you know, I can say whatever I want, and I don't care what anyone thinks. I mean, I have, I, I have like... Well, I'm sure all comedians have had people write to me or say to me afterwards that I didn't like this that you said or I didn't like that. Um, there are times that people have said that, and I've disagreed with them, and I could continue doing the joke. I have also had people say to me that they disagreed with something I had said, and I thought about it and agreed with them and stopped doing the joke. Um, so I think it's about having that responsibility. I, I, yeah, I don't really get uh, why some comics want to go after the most vulnerable people in, in society, but, I, but nor do I think it should be banned. I don't think there should be any type of restrictions. But also, I mean, contrary to what a lot of... Generally, the comedians that say... The, the, thing that, the thing that I really... Not much bothers me. The thing that really bothers me is hearing comedians complain that you can't say what you want anymore when they just did, and they got paid $50 million to say it on the world's biggest streaming network, and they said it, and millions saw it, and they got paid for it, and it's still there, and they go, you can't say anything anymore, and it's like, no, you can, but equally, people are allowed to also then write or post on Twitter that they didn't like it. You exercise your freedom of speech, they're exercising their freedom of speech to say they don't like it, um, and so I find it odd, that kind of argument, because to me, it just all kind of seems... But, but to answer your question, I mean, it's, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a worrying thought that people think that they can do that, but I think it's possibly something, you know, uh, you know storm a stage. Um, but you would hope that, yeah, security has been uh, upped everywhere. What is the security like here? How is it? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't seem to <laughs> Your security, bro. Um, oh, okay. oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi, how's it going? Uh, first, the integration told me to say hi. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I published my first book two years ago. Congrats. And this is the most common question I get asked. Mm. So the question is, what inspired you to share your story with the world? Um, I had pitched um, Goose Lane, an, a, a photography book idea, which I'd been working on with an amazing photographer by the name of Sean McGrath. Um, and send my love to Nancy, by the way. Nancy Regan, everyone, amazing, isn't she? Um, um, and I really want, what, the idea was to do a book on uh, the reality, essentially a, a photo documentary piece about the reality of being touring performers in this region, and really just depicting photographically the grind. And they said, that is definitely something we're interested in, uh, but we would like to read that first. We would like to read your um, story. And, and we tossed around lots of ideas, and, and it was like, is it a travelogue? Is it a memoir? Is it uh, a guide to Atlantic Canada? And I think ultimately, and they just said, just start writing. And I, essentially, I think it became all of those things. And as the structure formed, I realized that, yes, that this, is, this is the place that I found myself. So I wanted the whole, the whole narrative to be about here. But what was interesting when trying to gel between, for example, I mean, there's chapters obviously about, you know, um, tragedies in my life and um, you know, there's, there's suicide, there's depression, there's domestic violence, there's bullying. And so it was, it was I decided to just write and actually we didn't at any point try and strategically move things around. Um, it was, it's pretty much all chronological, um, other than the story about my, my, my grandfather um, losing, uh, getting lost in the Russian Revolution at the age of 10 and being uh, stranded for... But that felt relevant to come in when it did because essentially it's about the concept of home and, you know, finding a home that isn't your own. Um, 
<laughs> but yes, it all fit chronological. And so I think having done, this was, I think, something that I learned from, I, having done a lot of fundraiser gigs where I will come out and talk about domestic violence and, you know, colossal tragedies in our community, and then obviously segue into stand-up. Um, I, I felt like, those things can be side by side, and it's not disrespectful to, uh, for those things to, to kind of coexist. If that answers, yeah, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. We have one down here in the front row. Jane, you mentioned that you recently had a couple of stage deaths. Mm. You said you knew the reason why, and I'm wondering how did you know the reason why you had to so Good the, question. The question is, he's had a couple of stage deaths recently. How did you know what went wrong? Um, often, it, 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 interestingly, often it comes down to technical things. So, for example, I mean, the, the, the number one thing, the weird thing about being a uh, performing artist in this region is that 90% of the time when you're booked for a show, you are A, dealing with uh, someone who doesn't normally work with performers. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but they don't understand the intricacies of, they are, you know, uh, they work for a company, they're in HR, and they've been assigned the job of doing X, Y, and Z. Um, so, for example, they don't understand the absolute vitalness of uh, sound, the imperativeness of sound. So, uh, I've had numerous... I would, and the other thing is, of course, that unlike, for example, comedians in bigger cities, where 90% of the time they are performing in venues designed for performing arts. Most of the time you're in rooms that aren't designed for it. You're in a hotel conference room and someone's trying to make it work. So uh, a lot of the time it's sound related. And the, the tragedy, or the, the reality is, is that um, when I'm up on stage and the audience can't hear me, and then they all start talking because they can't hear me, uh, no one is thinking, isn't the sound bad? They're thinking, that's a shitty comedian. And, and they all leave saying that. And no one leaves saying, you know, the, the, this, the, the, the problem was this. You bombed. And, and so trying to manage that without a team of people and, and, and being that person who is turning up and having those conversations and trying to meticulously... Um, so, for example, I did a big show uh, a couple, uh, about 18 months ago, a big festival, where I arrived and they, they wouldn't let me sound check. And they said, the band has sound checked, but you can't sound check because it's about to rain and it's not safe. But you've done this enough times, and it was a big festival. And I thought, yeah, you know, they, they know. And I, I cursed myself for doing this. Um, and the sound was absolutely appalling. And of course, I mean, it, it was fine for the music in the it was outdoors. People could hear the music. They don't need to hear the intricacy. They didn't need to hear every single syllable of every single lyric. But with stand up, it, it, you do, you can't be strained. You need it needs to just be comfortable. You need to. And um, so it, invariably, it's that. Other times, I mean, there's a death that I describe in, in the book which was many years ago, but I, my first ever club weekend when I was uh, uh, paid to do a, a club, like, you know, I'm sure you all know how the, it works, but you do open spots and then you build up and then you eventually get paid to do a weekend in a club. And it was my first weekend at the Glee Club in Birmingham in the UK. And, and I turned up on the Friday night, and it was obviously Friday night, Saturday night, and, I'm in, and I've been working all week, and I've snuck out of work and pretended I was going to the loo, and then ran to the train and traveled for three hours, and I've arrived at the gig, and of course all the other comedians, they're professional comedians, so they've just been in bed all week e eating biscuits. <laughs> And, and they've just arrived and they're fresh and they're ready and they're confident and I am a, a mixture of like nerves and, and, and anxiety and stressed and tired and, and I, I, long story short, I, I, I walk out on stage for this gig, 400 people, it's known as the best club in the country because it was designed by comedians so if you, if you bomb there it's all on you, there's no blaming the sound in there. Um, and I walked out and just had an electric time. Everything clicked, and it was just one of those moments. And I walked around the next day. I wrote in my diary that, this is about 12 years ago, and I wrote in my diary that day, this is the first time in my life I've ever felt like a real comedian. And I said, I could, this is the first time I could picture myself one day maybe playing an arena, like, like that. I, 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 felt, I felt like I, I'd, something had clicked. And I walked around that day just feeling like on top of the air, uh, you know, just the happiest I've ever been. Arrived at the club that night, and I'd done two nights in a row at other clubs before, you know, as the open spot. And normally you walk in and you've bombed the night before, so you're kind of, no one wants to make eye contact with you. But I'm walking in and the security guys are high-fiving me, and the venue manager's shaking my hand, and I'm like, I'm the king, and I'm in the, I'm in the dressing room, like, I'm just chatting, you know, you know just, you're chatting with the other comics rather than hiding in the bathroom. And, you know, felt like a proper community, and you can see where this is going. And... <laughs> 
and, and, and it's the same room, it's the same lineup, everything's the same, the lighting's the same, the sound's the same, the room's packed again. The MC says the exact same thing when he brings me out, and I walk out and uh, just completely crash and burn. Just absolutely over, like, uh, I mean, just first joke, bombs, and it was word for word the same set, and so what went wrong? And essentially what it boiled down to, and I talk about this a lot, and I, I, occasionally I get hired to do like, keynote speeches uh, for companies about, about public speaking and presentation, and, and I know and what it was, was on the Friday night when I walked out, I, had the, I exuded the right balance of, of, of confidence, but also vulnerability and nerves, and there was a likability there somehow. There was something about the way that I walked out and pulled the mic out that the audience, not consciously, but subconsciously, went, we like the look of this guy, let's give him, give him a chance, right? And there was something in my demeanor that, that conveyed that, not in any way consciously, it just went into their brains and they said, we like this guy, we're going to, you know, let's, let's run with it. And I think on the Saturday night, I probably walked out like I owned the place, right? Where we were, you know, I don't know, I don't know what I did, I'm imagining. I don't know. What does an arrogant comedian look like? <laughs> Right. I, I don't know. And, and of course, there's a time and a place for that. Like, if you are, if you are Russell Peters and you're playing to 20,000 people, th that, that attitude is expected. In a club, you are there to win them over. They, they don't know you from Adam. You win them over. It, it's, a, it's a clean slate every night. Anyway, I think I walked out with... So I exuded or, or conveyed something that collectively, all 400 of them just went, don't like him. <laughs> don't like him, no. It, it, it seems like a wanker. Uh, <laughs> We're not going to laugh, and there was there was no pulling it back. And of course, I mean, now over the years, you can you can you can pull back bad gigs as you get better at it. But it just completely crashed and burned. Um, the first night, I got halfway through my set, and my twenty minutes were up because the last was so long. The second night, I did my full set, then did more because I realised the laughs were so small that, and I came off stage and I'd only done fourteen of my twenty minutes because, and that's the difference with, with the sounds of, of laughs anyway. And walked off, and no one wanted to make eye contact. People are edging away from you. Com other comedians, there's not like a, there's not a camaraderie. Like they literally like it's as if unfunniness is contagious. <laughs> like, like they're like get, get away. Like don't, don't don't jinx me. So yeah, they um, and there's no, and it's it's yeah, and so that is the perpetual um. I can't remember what the question was. I think oh, that was oh, the oh, sorry, there he is. Bad gigs, yes. Bad gigs, yeah, bad gigs. So it can be, it can be, it can be those things. And sometimes you uh, are standing in the wings. It's a very weird thing when you're standing in the wings, about to walk on stage, uh, whether it's 100 people or 1,000 or 5,000, and you're in there and you know this material. But what's weird is it's like a switch clicks when you walk out and you go into stage you. Like backstage you are just, you're, you're, you're 12-year-old you again, riddled with anxiety and nerves, uh, you know, I mean, some comedians, I, I see them backstage, they're like, yeah, I'm going to storm it, right? I, I'm always, like, backstage, you go, this is going to be a disaster. Uh, and, um, and something clicks. So I think the, th the only thing that really I get nervous about is worrying, what if the switch doesn't click? What if... Uh, and of course you are you, but it's, it's, it's the weirdest job in the world because you're basically, most jobs when you're under pressure, you don't have to pretend that you're not under pressure necessarily, whereas... In stand-up, you are having to act as if it's the most natural thing in the world, and you're thinking of this stuff, and, you, and instead, you're going through the roller decks in your head, and you're constantly... But, um, but, I mean, I love it, and it's the greatest feeling in the world doing it, and, um, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. This is the only way to end a James Mulliger show is to have your mic die, so you have to steal his to uh, give the extra. The only way to shut me up is to take my mic. We did give him a 90 minute mic battery, just we knew. Um, but I want to thank the Halifax Library for hosting us. Uh, for and I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out here into the wilds and joining us for this wonderful evening. Uh, but most of all, I think this is one of those shows where the switch clicked and everybody will make eye contact with James after. We're all in agreement. So James Mullinger, ladies and gentlemen, James Mullinger. James will be signing books over here. We're sticking around for a little bit. I'm going to sign a couple of books for James and James will be around here to take questions. So thank you all very much.